Sziasztok! Én Stöki vagyok az IDDQD blogtól. Az IDDQD ugye a Doom nevű játéknak a kódja. A Doom-ot egy id szoftver nevű cég fejlesztette, aminek alapítója John Romero itt áll személyesen. Úgyhogy virág földön a Doom, the man, the myth, the legend, John Romero. Hey everybody! Hello everyone, and welcome to PixelCon 2017. All right, I'm gonna start. <laughs> uh, when I was asked to speak at this event, I asked them, uh, what should I speak about? So I'm used to being asked to speak about first-person shooters uh, or programming, and especially my time at software, but for this talk, they wanted to hear something more. They wanted to hear my story and my history in the game industry. So there was something more than that though. Through my story, they wanted to kind of hear the industry's story. Then one day, they put this cabinet against the wall opposite the pinball machines. It was big and it was called Dune Buggy. One look inside the cabinet through the glass told me that this was new and amazing. It used a black light and it looked surreal. I'd never seen a game look so interesting before. There looked like what appeared to be a ghostly jeep that I drove around the landscape trying to avoid the car on the road. In the summer of 91, we held what we called the Id Summer Seminar, and Apogee brought many of their authors over to our lake house. We demonstrated our new Keen Engine tech and gave them lectures about how it worked, and some of those authors licensed our engine, and the modern engine licensing business was born out of that lake house. In September, we moved the company from Shreveport to Madison, Wisconsin. There were only four of us, so it was easy to do. In the last half of the year, we made another Commander Keen trilogy. And while working on that second Keen trilogy, we decided to make another 3D maze game and call it Catacomb 3D. This time, the walls were texture mapped. It made a huge difference. This was the first nice looking implementation of texture mapping in the game. The first example was in a 1985 game called Alternate Reality of the City. Just before Christmas of 91, Keen 4 was uploaded to the software creation BBS once again. And during this time, the Super Nintendo was doing phenomenally well. John Carmack and I used to play F-Zero competitively a lot. Super Mario was another favorite game of ours. Super Mario World. Working on the shareware episode of Wolfenstein 3D. During that four months, we also moved the company to Mesquite, Texas in March of 1992 because it was too cold in Wisconsin. So we finally got in software its own office. It was a tiny loft apartment in Mesquite, Texas. We all lived in the same apartment complex so we could just walk to work. We uploaded Wolf 3D on May 5th, 1992 at about 3 a.m. using a modem. We uploaded it to the Software Creations BBS as usual. Scott Miller and George Broussard were at our apartment while we uploaded it, and we knew it was going to be big. Wolfenstein 3D was released just six weeks after Ultima Underworld. 3D gaming was just beginning on the PC finally. So earlier in January, Dune 2, the prototypical real-time strategy game was released. So 1992 was shaping up to be a great year for games. At this time, virtual reality was trying to happen. Dactyl Nightmare was the premier VR game, and it was very low res and choppy. An outfit in Kentucky wanted to adapt a Wolfenstein 3D to VR to just imagine playing. So even before starting work on the game, we decided on the name, which was Doom. We knew everything tech-wise that we wanted to put in the game, and like idiot savants, we put out a press release that told the world that Doom was going to herald another technical revolution in PC programming. This is, this is the opening paragraph of the press release. The rest of it describes the game. There's a quote from John Carmack in it that says, Wolfenstein is primitive compared to Doom. We're doing Doom the right way this time. Another incredibly important paragraph in the Doom press release is this. An open game. When our last hit, Wolfenstein 3D, was released, the public responded with an almost immediate deluge of homebrewed utilities. Map editors, sound editors, trainers, etc. All without any help on the file formats or game layout from mid software. Doom will be released as an open game. We will provide file formats and technical notes for anyone who wants them. 
people will be able to easily write and share anything from their map own map editors to communication network drivers. The entire year of 1993 was filled with so much experimentation. Until then, we'd not experimented too much in our game development. We just made the game, usually in two months. So experimentation happened while making the game. We didn't put a hard deadline on shipping Doom. It's done when it's done was our motto. We knew how to ship games fast. Not having a hard deadline was not making us not ship games. <laughs> we were driven to ship. So at this point, we knew that we were in the lead. There would be no games with newer technology and better design creeping up behind us. So we were building something that we had never seen before. We first started feeling invincible just after Wolfenstein 3D was released, and Doom's development just reinforced it. And it was a very challenging and strange time because while I was feeling down about leaving, everything in my life was getting more exciting. After Quake, I left and co-founded Ion Storm with my friend Tom Hall. We've repeated the same pattern of digital distribution from the 80s into a faster, sleeker model. Another interesting note is that the RPG company I used to work for, Origin Systems, was bought by EA in 1993 and eventually shut down in 2004. EA is now using that name for their own digital download storefront that competes with Steam. So it looks like the origin cycle is repeating in a different manifestation. So the next pattern is multiplayer gaming. When computers entered the home, games became overwhelmingly single player. For as long as people have played games, they've been mostly multiplayer. Chess, checkers, pretty much all board games, card games, baseball, basketball, football, games have always been multiplayer, but now, with a new home computer, they're single player. So Doom came out at the right time when local uh, area networking was emerging and modems were everywhere. So Doom broke the single player spell of the previous 20 years since the start of the computer game industry. The next pattern is eSports, which depends on multiplayer having been popularized. Following the release of Doom, LAN parties became popular. People began lugging their huge CRTs and towers to their friends' houses for a weekend of deathmatch. And after Quake in 1996, team-based deathmatch tournaments got big. Clans formed and real competition began with cash prizes. Several leagues sprung into existence. Computer games are not games according to people who played D&D and board games back in the 70s. And console games aren't games according to computer game players in the 1980s. This was a huge issue, or there was a huge issue, when the C was dropped from the Computer Game Developers Conference and it became GDC. The Game Developers Conference in 1999 to include all platforms, not just computers. The case of incredible timing, the day after the congressional hearings on video game violence, we released Doom on December 10th of 1993. I believe games, however, are cultural, and I believe that the violence we see in the world goes beyond games. Plenty of countries play games, Canada, Germany, Japan, England, Hungary. They're all hardcore consumers of games, yet we don't see similar outbreaks of violence in these countries. It's not the game, it's the gun. It's not the computer, it's the culture. It's not the player. Let me change my last topic. Where are we going as an industry? Well, there's currently a high interest in investment in VR and AR technologies. Everyone is trying to find a new way to see games and play games. Augmented reality has immediate and wide-ranging applications of seen through your phone's camera. Mobile gaming gets more incredible with every year. There's lots of experimentation with new 3D games, with how 3D games, can be played on a smartphone without the player feeling like they're navigating an avatar through a world the same way that they do on a console or a PC. And games are getting more social, which is where they really find huge success. Combine new technologies and new design together, and you know what can happen. I, be I believe procedural generation is going to reach a more impressive level as programmers and designers apply and discover more advanced techniques such as machine learning. Procedural synthesis might be in implemented in popular engines as plugins, much like the way Speedtree handles foliage generation. Procedural synthesis algorithmically generates graphics. This technique's been used since the early 80s on the Commodore 64, Atari 800, and later computers for demo scene entries. I still believe that games have to have great design to be successful. Tech by itself is not enough, but great tech combined with great design is a huge win. What does all this great technology and design mean? 
Well, it means what it's always meant. We're going to continue to have even more amazing games. Thank you for having me at PixelCon. Thank you, John. Awesome presentation. Thank you. <laughs> After I left, the only thing I did with id Software was help to create the id anthology um, in the months following, you know, after, after I left, um, just before I started Ion Storm. But that was the last time that I had actually, actually worked with it. And do you have get togethers with the old id guys? Um, yeah. Uh, Adrian Carmack, uh, he owns a hotel in Ireland, so we get together a lot. Um, Tom Hall and I talk a lot. My, my oldest son is his lead programmer in San Francisco on Tom's games. Um, so us three talk uh, to, to each other a bit. Most lehetőség lesz, hogy a közönség is kérdezzen. Aki szeretne kérdezni John-tól valamit, az tegye fel a kezét, én le fogok menni. Nyugodtan lehet magyarul is, és megkérem Citrust, hogy, hogy tolmácsoljon akkor angolul. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious, what do you think of the uh, Doom 2016, the latest game? Uh, I actually like the single player part of the game. I wasn't excited about the multiplayer because it was like a copy-paste of Halo. But, uh, <laughs> but the single player was cool. I liked it. It wasn't the same as the old games, which was really hard to do anyway. Um, but I thought it was fast and, and, uh, and I had fun playing it. It wasn't predictable, so that was good. Well, I mean, I think, I think running servers is great. I, it kind of sucks that dedicated servers are kind of gone now, because um, everybody loved running those with Quake. Uh, and I don't really talk to John because he's in VR world, um, and, uh, and really, if you knew him, he doesn't talk to many people. He's just really busy coding all the time, and he only talks to people that he needs to get information from, so, uh, so we don't really talk. So, the last question, the gentleman. Okay. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> Hello. So, you basically, I want to ask what you think about the idea of binding authorship of a huge work to one person. Like, in movies, you will always see that the movie is associated with the director, even though it was worked on by, like, hundreds of people, and this is a trend that has been popping up in more and more games. Like, in, like you see that every edition of Metal Gear Solid is a game by Hideo Kojima and it's written on the box or a game by Cliff Klosinski even though hundreds and hundreds of people worked on the game. Do you think this is a, a good thing or a natural thing to happen? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's fair. Um, I think it, if the person who is designing and coming up with the inspiration and is the driving force behind the game should get recognition um, because I think it helps marketing so when people see that person's name, it helps to sell the game versus here comes another game with a name and you don't know any, you don't know, it's got a cool name, but you don't know anything about it. When it has somebody's name attached to it, that lets you know what kind of game it probably is and if it's going to be good or not. So I think in marketing, it's really helpful. Um, you know, back, in, back when the industry started, everybody had their names right on the front of the package. And as teams formed and got bigger, they kind of stopped doing that. So if you look at like Assassin's Creed, Unity, like do you even know who was in charge of making that? Who was the guy that designed it? You know, that came up with the, the original vision of the game. Um, I, think it's, I think it's useful for marketing. And I have one last question too. How did you like the Doom movie? The Doom movie? <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> I want a reboot. <laughs> That's what I expected. So, thank you, John. Because you say thank you, Thank you for thank you, uh, everybody.
akkor lássuk a döntőt! Átadom a szót! Köszönöm szépen! Szóval a döntősöket lássuk játszani John Romero ellen. Úgy néz ki, hogy ez még csak a bemelegítő. A játék mindjárt kezdődik. Viszont egy nagy tapsot kérnék a döntősöknek. Megérdemlik a srácok, ugyanis csak egyetlen egynek sikerült legyőzni John romero -t. A többi kettő, meg ő nekik volt a legtöbb fragjük. Még egy kör tapsot kérnék. 
És akkor kezdődjön a finálé! Ki él az első frag? Az első frag John romero -é. hogy angolul közvetíthetném, szóval akkor most már át fogok váltani. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the finals of Duke. John Romero is winning with two frags. Then the left team has one frag. The front team has two frags, now three. And he's going like a steamroller. And the right team with one frag and John Romero It seems that he wins with four. He's using shotgun to minus the enemies.
Mag... Welcome. Welcome to City 17.